Well, good day, friends that I haven't met yet. I uh, want to welcome you to this. Um, should end up being about six hours, <coughs> between six and 6.5 contact hours of uh, this forward facing professional resilience course, which has been uh, named a lot of things over the past 20 years. Uh, the compassion fatigue prevention, fitness for the front line. It's been, uh, it's been through multiple iterations. I've been doing R and D on this thing for about, uh, 23 years and I'm excited to get to present it to you. I want to give you just a little bit of the, uh, the legacy before we get started, not, not to bore you with it, but to, to, to show you that it's, it's providence that it's, uh, this has been an evolution of a lot of work and started out at Florida State uh, when I was in my doctoral program working with Charles Figley, who wrote the book, for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the book on compassion fatigue, um, uh, helping those that treat the traumatized, I think was the subtitle of his long subtitle. <clears throat> and he wrote that in 1995, published it in late 1995. And I started my doctoral program there in 1996. So it, it, Tallahassee kind of became the epicenter of everything that was going on with compassion fatigue at the time. And um, there were two, I was starting my doctoral program under his direction and I was his research assistant uh, as he was beginning Green Cross at the time. Um, and two students, one, a doctoral student doing her internship had come from um, Ottawa University in Canada and a social worker uh, from Tasmania was doing a six month fellowship. So the three of us were all together. Um, and we spent uh, the spring of 1997 building a, um, a treatment program for compassion fatigue called the Accelerated Recovery Program. And it was a five-session model. Um, and, it was, God, it was crazy. We spent, uh, we spent hours every day in my apartment or on campus uh, just trying out interventions. Because at the time, everybody was talking about uh, taxonomy, how to, what was and what to call compassion fatigue, and then how to measure it was the big kind of thrust of, you know, what were the factors, what was it? And then how do you measure it? And everybody was kind of focused on that, but nobody had talked about treatment yet. And, you know, I was, I'd been uh, <coughs> in practice for, at that point, um, 20 years or so. <coughs> um, is that right? 90? No, no. Uh, 15 years at that point. Um, <coughs> and... Uh, about 10 of those, eight of those in private practice. And I was an anxious therapist. Uh, so I got, you know, I was certified and trained in everything. I got trained in EMDR and TIR and TFT and NLP and DBT and, you know, all that alphabet soup of, of treatments. <clears throat> so I had a whole kind of pot full of pasta that I could sling at my clients, uh, hoping something would work. Man, I was a complete and total technocrat back in those days <clears throat> that, if you had the right technique, then your clients would get better. I've since learned better than that. Um, so we just started kind of Frankensteining all these different interventions together. And we ended up uh, just just by uh, luck and kismet, we're able to uh, put together five a five session model that worked really well. We, we ended up uh, doing some beta testing and, and published some of that. Uh, with 21 volunteers from the North Florida area. And we got just a profound results with everybody, complete shift in symptoms uh, and their, their qualitative stuff uh, talked about how much better their lives had gotten. And it was really profound. It was, uh, it was pretty incredible. <clears throat> so um, we started building uh, a, a training to teach other people how to do the accelerated recovery program. And when we, when folks started coming to that through the green cross and uh which were the Traumatology Institute at, Flor at Florida State, what we saw is the folks that, it was originally a Friday night and then it's all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Um, and then it became a two day. And then we, we cooked it into this one day because what we saw was as we were teaching people to treat compassion fatigue, as they were learning the interventions, the participants of the intervention were, were and, and the participants of the course. So, you know, uh, mental health professionals that were going to add the ARP to their clinical repertoire to help um, other people, other caregivers that had were suffering from their work. As they went through the course, what happened was they had this symptom resolution and transformation in their lives. And it was kind of like, 
duh, what's happening? And it was kind of profound. And we published, I think it was in, no, it was, it, we didn't publish then, uh, but but we wrote, uh, we, we talked about it, published in, in some uh, trade journals, not anything uh, peer-reviewed, but started looking at, at uh, training and treatment at that point. And uh, we, we, as I said, we took those elements of the training and instead of teaching folks how to treat compassion fatigue, we took what we saw were the essential elements of, of compassion fatigue intervention and prevention and put it in this, this one day workshop. Um, and I don't know, way over a hundred thousand people that I've done uh, this one day workshop with on four different continents and a bunch of different countries. And uh, a thousand times, I, I bet I've, I've presented maybe not a thousand, but 800, uh, you know, a lot of times I've presented this, this workshop and here's one more <clears throat> and I'm excited to get to do it. Uh, one of the things that I do want to say is that we've published uh, 11 studies uh, that I, I Either I've been uh, the author on one of the on one of the authors on that study, or somebody has been studying this particular protocol. We have eleven uh, peer-reviewed articles that have demonstrated the effectiveness of this workshop training as treatment with the people participating in the workshop lessening their symptoms and. Um, <clears throat> There's been a few uh, folks talk about that since then, but we really kind of looked at the first folks to have looked at that, that how do you how do you take a CEU activity and turn that into something that ameliorates the uh, the symptoms that people are experiencing from their work or from their lives? Um, and it's pretty cool. You know, how do you get mental health professionals to to do their work? You hang some CEUs on us. Um, so this is that course. Uh Boy, there's just a lot of anecdotes that I could share with you about all kinds of stuff, but uh, but I'm not going to. Um, I will let you judge for your own self, uh, let you uh, participate in the elements of this workshop and try them out and see if they do not uh, immediately improve your quality of life. You know, when I do this as a live training, I say every one of you are going to walk out of this training today knowing how to never experience stress again for the rest of your life. And folks go, yeah, right, 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 right. And I say, okay, here's the deal. Um, I get it. That You know, I, I'd be skeptical if somebody said that to me. And I was sitting in a, in a, a, a training uh, activity. And I say, then I follow that up with, with this. If I don't it, deliver on that, if you do not walk out of today's training, not knowing how, Really good conceptual understanding. And for those of you that are mental health professionals, and some of you who are just, uh, not just, but uh, who are uh, health professionals ac across the board, nurses, physicians, um, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, nursing assistants, um, any care provider, and then into, you know, uh, law enforcement, EMFs, all of you. You're going to learn about how your job, <clears throat> ooh, I can't say that yet. We'll come back to that. You're going to learn how to never experience stress again <clears throat> for the rest of your lives. Um, and, and a really good conceptual understanding of that. And what you'll find happening after this training, if you've not ever heard this material before, and, and the way I put it together, specifically, what a lot of folks find is that they end up that that it makes just so much simple sense that they find themselves using um, this information, this understanding, as part of the way that they psychoeducate their clients, helping them to start to get that if you don't know what your autonomic nervous system is doing, you can't interrupt its activity, and so you got to start learning about the way your autonomic nervous system is functioning as you go through your day, and and learn how to to intervene with it. <clears throat> but you're also going to have a felt sense. Feel what it feels like to be in a body that is relaxed and comfortable and is not experiencing symptoms of stress. And then it's just about practicing it from then onward. And, you know, what I do at the uh, end of every one of these, every uh, time I teach this material, uh, sometime in the afternoon, 
uh, towards the end of the day, I say, so how many of you are leaving today's training knowing how to never experience stress again for the rest of your lives? And what happens is folks go, yeah, 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 okay. Uh, you didn't tell me it was going to be, uh, uh, you know, it, that it was going to involve work. <clears throat> well, it does. It does involve work. It's, it's pretty easy work, but it does involve you doing different things and changing the way that you manage yourself in situations. But for those of you who have suffered for years from your work, it's a pretty low tax for you to get to work for the rest of your life in this field and not suffer from it. And that's what all this R&D has evolved to. And I can say this now with authority, with empirical underpinning, and it's the foundation upon which this course is built, is <clears throat> that if you do not have to suffer to be a professional caregiver. And if you are suffering from your work, you're doing it wrong. And I can say that with authority because for thousands of people, I have helped them craft navigational pathways through their work that they do not suffer and they rekindle mission and they're excited about going to work and they have joy and compassion, satisfaction. And, you know, that's what I hope happens for you guys that are watching this. Enough of preamble. I'll get into the, into the work now. Um, that all of that R&D has kind of uh, uh, culminated, uh, at least, you know, the, the end point of that <clears throat> right now, there's a bunch more that's, that's going to evolve from here, but, but where we are now is that uh, Jim and I, uh, Jim Dietz is a, he just retired this past year, 35-year uh, emergency physician with, I think, 18 of those being medical director at a large hospital, uh, the emergency department. And um, he uh, was a partner with uh, what was called CEP America at the time, it has changed their name to Batuity, a large practice of physicians on the West Coast, but they run ERs all over the country. Um, and different parts, it used to be just emergency physicians. Now they do psychiatry and hospitalists and a bunch of different things. But a lot of docs in that practice, a total of about 5,000 practitioners. I think there's about 3,000 docs and mid-levels, uh, nurse practitioners and PAs, and then <clears throat> a smattering of other folks. Um, and we spent 10 years developing this material for physicians. And one of the things that I learned, uh, that we learned early on, was that physicians could not hear this from a mental health professional. So I had to train some of the, um, the physicians that were part of the, we call it the Emergency Medicine Resiliency Project, um, that were part, I, I trained them to be facilitators and co-facilitators of this material. And Jim was the, the coordinator of that project. And um, uh, we did that for 10 years and then the project closed and we decided that we wanted to kind of leave a legacy of, of this material and we published this book. And um, it's, uh, I don't know when you'll be watching this, but uh, it's, it's now uh, June of 2020, and we published this in January of this year. Um, and the cool thing about this text is it just follows this workshop. It's just a deeper dive into everything uh, associated with this workshop. Um, so if you want to, you know, if anything in this, this workshop, it, it, as you're watching this video is intriguing for you, I would invite you to, uh, to access this book and, um, and it, it goes, uh, much deeper into the stuff that for some of the stuff, just so I can get this all in a six hour process, um, I'll be, uh, I'll be kind of glossing over. Also want to, um, this is my contact information and it, it is in your manual. Uh, you should have a PDF associated with this course. Um, if for so, whatever reason, however it is that you're, you're getting your hands on this course, you do not have the PDF manual for this course, then email me um, and I will happily uh, get you a copy of that. Uh, be glad to send that to you. Uh, my contact information is is here. It's my uh, mailing address. This is probably the best email for me. Um, uh, J period Eric period Gentry dot PhD at Gmail. And uh, this is my new website forwardfacing.com. Um, so you can access me and some of the materials uh, associated with this course as we build that website over the next year. I've just just really started it. I used to have uh, Compassion Unlimited, but I'm evolving everything into under the kind of rubric of uh, of forward facing. 
you notice that that was uh, trademarked, um, that I trademarked forward facing, and I'll, I'll talk to you later today about what, what the forward facing process is. Um, and then uh, I am just in the process of, of acquiring service marks to be able to register and allow people to use forward facing processes. And I have that um, as both facilitators for this course, uh, I have a training program for, I have facilitators for clinicians to, uh, for, uh, programs for clinicians to be able to use uh, the forward facing accelerated recovery program for treatment and for clinicians and non clinical folks to do consulting in um, leadership and professional development. Uh, using these principles. So if that's intriguing for anybody, you're welcome to contact me. But mostly what I want to do is to uh, to make you aware that that all I've got lots of free goodies, um, uh, videos, uh, workbooks, audio, uh, journal articles, yada, yada, yada all on my resource page at Arizona Trauma Institute. And that is the address for my research resource page that you can go to and download free stuff. And as there's more stuff developed, I just put it on there. So you can, um, you can access all of that and uh, you're free to, to make use of it. And um. The other preamble thing I want to say is, um, is this. If there's any, any way that I can ever be of service to you in the performance of your mission of being of service to people who are traumatized, suffering, or addicted, it would be my privilege to do so. And... Um, if you find yourself suffering from your work and you need some help, you contact me. I promise you I'll help you find the resources that you need that you don't have to suffer from your work anymore. You have my word on that. This is my job. It is my covenant. It's my mission. It's why I'm on this planet. Is that I help people that help people who are traumatized or suffering. Okay. Um, so I talked to you a little bit earlier about a manual, and um, I hope I had the good sense to open that before we started. I did, I did. I love when I catch myself being confident. It's such a rare thing. Um, and it's, uh, I can't remember how many pages, 74 page manual with all the slides are in the manual. So it's kind of a cool way to follow along if you want to, if you want to use that. But if you look on uh, in your manual on page six, um, what I'd invite you to do, I think you'll get a lot more out of the course. If you just pause the course right now and you open up your manual, you'd either download the PDF or just uh, or print it and 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 do this uh, do this instrument. This is developed by Beth Stam, and she. Uh, I think she got, her and, and Charles built the very first compassion fatigue instrument in 1995, even before he published the book. And then they uh, revised it, I think, in 98. And Anna and I, Anna Branowski and I re revised it once. And she's continued to amass data and um, has worked on, uh, this is the fifth iteration of the ProQual, the ProQual 5. Um, and uh, has got a pretty nice instrument. It's a pretty useful tool. Um, and I invite you, invite you to take it because what it does is it, it not only is it a good self-assessment, it, it kind of lets you look into and start to see um, the two primary factors that produce compassion fatigue, and that's secondary traumatic stress and burnout. And this instrument has 30 items, and it has three subscales. Um, as I, the, the two previous ones that I said, uh, secondary traumatic stress, burnout, and compassion satisfaction. Compassion satisfaction is highly correlated with resilience and quality of life. It's kind of a, a good measure for, uh, you know, low secondary traumatic stress, low burnout scores, high compassion satisfaction scores, 
is the definition of professional quality of life. Um, so you can start to make some sense out of, of what, those, what those different elements look like. What's the difference between burnout and secondary trauma and stress? I'm going to go into that, but, but this will be examples from your own life that you'll be able to pull up because while you're answering these, you'll be thinking through your professional experiences. Um, it's a little, it takes about eh, 20 minutes or so to work it all the way through. And that's for fast folks. And it was somewhere anywhere between, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, give yourself to do on this. Because um, you answer all the questions first. And then as you look over uh, on page eight, it you have to kind of sniff out the subscales. So you, the compassion satisfaction subscale is items 3, 6, 12, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 27, 30, 10 items in each of the subscales. So you go back to your uh, page five. I'm sorry, page six, and you write down the scores of all those items here and then total them up. And that's your sum score. Um, same with burnout, but burnout's a little tricksy because it's got uh, items number one, four, 15, 17, and 29. Five of those items are reverse scores, so you have to reverse those. So if you scored number one as a one, uh, you go down here and change it to a five. Um, if you scored it as a four, you change it to a two. So you got to change all of those scores and then add up all of those. And that gives you the total for that. And then secondary traumatic stress um, items. You see the items there. And then it talks a little bit about uh, you can kind of do a little bit of talking about what all that means. Uh, uh, read that uh, that she's got on page um, page seven. So I would suggest that you start the this course with having done that um so and and to kind of for short order we're going to unpack these much more um voluminously i promise you as we get into it but as i said previously compassion satisfaction is is synonymous with professional resilience and um and satisfaction with one's work um there's lots of different research and and uh, kind of philosophies and theoretical orientations about what burnout and secondary traumatic stress is. But to make it simple, here's the difference. Burnout is the effects that your work environment have upon you. They are things like scheduling, like low pay like uh, office politics, like the jerk of the boss, like, um, uh, you know, um, workplace violence, uh, um, all of those pieces of the scheduling that, that, that are environmentally kind of part of what you encounter as you navigate through your day at work. <clears throat> Whereas secondary traumatic stress are the effects that come from interacting with people who are traumatized or suffering or their immediate family members or friends. So it's being among people who are hurting and hearing those stories, witnessing their wounds, uh, tending to their wounds, both physical and psychiatric, psychological, emotional, um, being in that in that role of uh, absorbing a lot of of pain and trauma, and those two burnout and secondary traumatic stress come together. The effects of both of those uh, individually, and then the uh, synergistic effect they have upon each other, uh, is what compassion fatigue is. Bada bing, bada boom. So during, uh, when I do the workshop live, we started out, I do a little preamble, but not as long as I've done with you guys. And I, I pass out index cards. And I have them write down on the index cards. Three negative effects from your work as a professional caregiver. And... and you know, only three. Some of you could come up with a whole litany of them. And those usually end up being stuff like, you know, fatigue, irritation, irritable, uh, relational problems, overeating, 
overspending, drinking, um, uh, and somatic, somatic stuff, uh, headache, gastrointestinal distress. Uh, but, you know, those are kind of the common ones. And, the, and I give them 90 seconds or so to write that down. And I always do it with the audience, sharing that, that process with them. And then what I say is, uh, okay, now what I'm going to ask you to do is to take those cards and hold them here at about 10 height. And I want you to get up and, and we're going to walk around the room. And I'm going to allow, I want you to allow others to bear witness to what you have written on your cards while you allow others to bear witness to what you've written on your cards. And you see folks' eyes get pretty big. Um, and I say, uh, you know, uh, only in, I've softened in my old age. I used to just not give f folks a choice. I just kind of put that those demand characteristics on it. But now I say, um, you know, that anybody that does not want to participate, this, there's no coercion on this activity. Please feel free to, to sit comfortably where you are. But those of you who are willing to participate, please all rise. And, um, and there's a chuckle with that. And we move around the room. And you can see folks that are pretty anxious about doing it. And they're, they're looking around the room. And, um, and, and what I start seeing is two minutes, three minutes is all I, I take to do that. But as, you, as they start going around the room, here's what you start seeing. Is that they start, there starts being all these nodding heads in the room. And uh, it becomes, you know, it's silent at first, but by the end of three minutes that it's, there's conversation and folks are connecting and, um, and, and the mood's really changed in those three minutes. And folks come back together. I ring my little bell and, um, um, and, it, and say, uh, find your way back to your seats. And, you know, we're, we're 30 minutes into the workshop. And I, I say, you know, if you want to get some some uh, refreshments, now it's okay. It's not a break. But if you want to get a coffee or whatever as you're getting your way back to your seat, that's fine. And then once everybody sits down, I say, okay, now um, I want to take 20 minutes or so to have a discussion with you. And and help me understand what's the purpose of that activity? Why do why do we put that at the beginning of this workshop? What's what's the value in it? And what ends up is some really rich conversation comes from there. <clears throat> and I want to highlight some of those things. And you know, it's the first chapter in the book. And <clears throat> you know, it's it's uh, today's June sixth, two thousand twenty. And um, there have been 13 days of uh, protests in the United States and protesting about this thing that's happening in this workshop, uh, that's happening in this exercise. And the thing that's happening is the movement to inclusion, is becoming part of a we, is connection. And it's the beginning of dismantling of polarization. And it ends up being essential for the resolution of compassion fatigue, for the resolution of toxic environments, is that you got to start to dismantle polarity and help folks to begin to value inclusion instead of separation, instead of polarization. Um, and, and so I... I when I ask the question is the way the, the answer that comes back most often is this. Um, so that we don't feel alone. That's what most people say is what they see as the intention of this exercise. And I say, how did that happen? And they say, well, I started seeing other people had cards just like mine. And why is that valuable? What's happening when the folks are going around the room and they're looking at cards and, and they're starting to nod their head? And I, usually as an adjunct to that, I say, did you notice that there was a shift in your anxiety level throughout this exercise from the beginning of when you started it till the end when I rang the bell? Three minutes. Did, did your level of anxiety change of 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 being nervous or um, uh, being uncomfortable with the exercise. And most folks say yes. And I say, well, did it go up or did it go down? It went down. 
Well, what do you account for? What did this three minutes do? How did it lower the anxiety level other than the six calories that you burned walking around the room, uh, which would have not been sufficient enough to lower lower your anxiety? Something something else must be going on. What is it? And some intrepid folks get the answer to that. Um, but I just want to tell you what it is for most people is that We've grown up in environments of professional caregiving that's, that are dangerous. And I want to put that in quotes. They're not really, but they're perceived as threatening um, because of all the painful learning we've had at the hands of evaluation. And, um, you know, what happens by, because of all of our learning and how, you know, our schools were competitive, um, work was competitive to get the job, that what we've learned from our training is that we, especially, you know, mental health and other health professionals, we should be okay. And that if we're not, something's wrong with us. And something, if something's wrong with us, then we are diminished in our competency. And we can't let anybody see that. So that what happens is the more symptomatic that I get, the more that I begin to suffer from my work, the more perceivedly threatening are my peers. And what starts happening with folks is that they become more insular and more isolatory. Um, they are less engaged in genuine peer-to-peer -peer interventions. And that's what we've learned, you know, especially with physicians. Uh, peer support with physicians is more powerful as a uh, lowering stress levels than is vacation. <clears throat> um, it is one of the most potent aspects of professional resilience is the ability to have and utilize a support network. But what happens to people who are in toxic environments and they get sick from that toxicity, which everybody does to some degree. And I say, you know how we know that? How many blank cards did you see? And everybody chuckles like there were no blank cards. Every one of you had some effects. But the problem is, is that the more you're in a toxic environment, the more that you compare your insides with other people's outsides. You're starting to suffer some pain. You're beginning to be in discomfort in a lot more and more of the day. But you look at everybody else and it looks like that they're just doing fine. And they're not, as evidenced by the card. I mean, they're, we're all doing okay, but we're all carrying some pain with us. And what happened was that the threat of somebody seeing you during this exercise, the threat of somebody seeing you as less than perfect, seeing you flawed, seeing you with imperfect, just diminished significantly as a threat because of the vulnerability sharing of others. And that, I believe, is a really important hurdle in maturation as a resilient caregiver. Those folks that, that are conscripted either through, because of their developmental experiences or other developmental experiences in their early childhood, developmental experiences as a professional, i.e. a lot of physicians, that they just can't allow somebody to see them as being flawed because it's it's so terrifying and that's what all their training programs taught them to not to not exhibit that part of themselves so they become more and more they become strong like oak not strong like palm you know that they that, that they're they're strong and brittle instead of strong and, and resilient and you see a lot of people that that use that way of coping that when things get bad that they snap that they that they uh, are explosive that they keep the lid on and then they're explosive and that's not resilience. <clears throat> so I want to establish early on in this workshop, and I want to look at you right now through the eye of the camera, and if there's any way that that my soul and spirit can reach you. And say to you, 
that you are welcome here and in your workplace. No matter what, you've, you've earned the right to be there. And that no matter what you're challenged with, your worth is not diminished. Your worth is not diminished. No matter how much that you're carrying with you, whether that is cancer or depression, you're still a viable caregiver as a member of this guild, this fellowship of caregivers. And that's what happens to people who become more and more symptomatic is they more and more and more um, believe that they that they're that they're frauds that they don't belong here that what they do is that they excommunicate themselves from this this guild and they end up showing up at work being being a complete persona not having relationships that soothe and diminish symptoms that instead they have perfunctory relationships and and they're managing their threat response about other people about what other people think about them all day long. And that makes the environment even more toxic. So the starting of healing that is, is being a part of, being part of a we, you know, that to, to recognize that we're all flawed, we're all challenged, we're all carrying pain in this work. And we're amongst peers. And to settle down and begin to develop those relationships with each other is how you navigate through a toxic environment without getting sick from it. And hopefully this starts you thinking about that. That's the primary purpose of this activity. And there's a couple other subtle ones for the folks that have not ever done the pro qual. Um, and uh, I, I, I used to do it as part of this workshop, but it ends up in a group of people, it ends up taking at least a half an hour, but usually ends up 40, 45 minutes out of a six hour day. And there's just not that much data to be like, you get most of what you're going to get from the insight from Prokoff from this activity. Because what happens is, is as you go around the room, you started with your three things and you're looking at other people's cards going, yeah, I got that one too. Didn't think about that. No, I don't really have that. Yeah, that one. And and it ends up becoming a self accept self assessment. Um, this exercise of the silent witness does, and you end up starting to kind of. Um, it's not it's not thorough and it's qualitative, but it does end up starting to develop the awareness of that I didn't think about that being something that was associated with my work or, or uh, a result of, of the environment of my work. So it heightens awareness. Um, and that's a really good thing that it does. And then the other thing that happens as a result of this activity is this. And the way I uh, process this in a live training, I say, how many of you know somebody who's in recovery from chemical dependency? And almost everybody raises their hand. And I say, for those of you who know somebody that has, you know, ongoing abstinence from uh, from drugs or alcohol, or both, and both, um, what was the very first thing they had to do to be able to get clean or get sober? What was the very first step in in transitioning out of the problem into the solutions? And somebody always says they had to admit they had a problem. And I go, you betcha. And what I've found is with compassion fatigue is that it works kind of the same way that addiction works. Like addiction requires denial for it to continue. So does compassion fatigue. That there is a uh, pre-conscious, subconscious suppression of the awareness that my work is causing my distress. And what happens is folks get scared about about that they're in distress they know that but but what the, what do they do is they just throw it all behind them and they keep going and don't think about it very much it just kind of ends up becoming 
this dissociative walling off behind them of all the negative effects and just keep chugging along. As they add more and more coal cars of pain behind them that they're chugging along carrying. Um, just like just like an alcoholic or an addict, you know, that it's 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 the it's your fault. I really don't have a problem. It's because it's Thursday that I need to get high. You know, it's it's all externalized. And it's until the person can kind of start to come to the, to the understanding that, yes, I have a problem in my life. And the way that I'm using chemicals is contributing significantly to that problem. And I need to do something about that. That's where things change. It turns out the same is true with compassion fatigue. And it usually comes with a crisis that most folks continue to stay in denial, just like, you know, uh, alcoholics or addicts. It's not until they get arrested that they get sick, that they have some serious consequence that, that, <sighs> that the, the denial falls away and they start seeing and they get ready for change with that. The same is true with compassion fatigue. Um, and what happens to folks who never have that, who continue to successfully stay in denial? What happens with them is they get sick or they have a crisis that either forces them to change or ends their career or they change fields. What my hope is during, you know, as you've thought about this process, what I say to folks that do the live and actually write down the three things, I say, what did it take for you to get those three things on, that, on those index cards? Um, and somebody always says, I, have, I had to think, and I'm say, I always apologize for that. I'm sorry. Um, and I said, yes, you had to think, but you did had to do something more than... Something between thinking and writing. What happened between thinking and writing to get those three things on the card? And somebody always says, I had to acknowledge or accept that I have these effects and that they are somehow associated with my work. And that's important because most people come to continuing ed experiences as voyeurs. You know, let me kind of sit back here and work on my stuff. And, uh, I'll, I'll keep one ear on what Eric's saying and kind of do, 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 all, do what else I'm doing. And that's cool if you decide to do that. Uh, I don't have any, any issues around the way that you use this material. Um, I try to keep my attention and power focused on where I have uh, the ability to change things and the ability to affect things. And it ain't you. <clears throat> so, but as you start seeing that you do have some effects and they are associated with your work, you heard me say at the beginning of this thing that, you know, this, this workshop you're about to engage, that you're about to experience is an evidence-based treatment for the symptoms of compassion fatigue. And some of you are deciding right now at this moment, you know what, I'd like to get me some relief from these effects. So that instead of being a voyeur, yeah, I'm going to participate in this thing. I'm going to engage. I'm going to try it, see what happens. Doesn't cost me very much. And so that the timbre for a lot of folks' uh, engagement in this workshop changes that from passive to active. And that's another reason why I do this activity. Okay, so that's what we start with. And then I need to introduce to you a man who's more my father than my biological father, and his name's Victor Frankel. If you've not ever heard of him, then uh, Man's Search for Meaning is a required reading if you're in any helping activity. It just is. And Victor and his work is at the cornerstone of this course. It's at the cornerstone of forward-facing work. Everything I do is standing on the shoulders of Victor Frankl. And his hopefully his spirit is infused here with me today as I present this material to you. And for those of you not familiar with Victor Frankl, he uh, was a neurologist in Vienna. 
um, who was captured by the SS. He and his wife were captured by the SS in 1941 um, and spent the next three and a half years um, interned in several different Nazi prison and death camps, uh, most of the time in the Auschwitz system where he was starved, tortured without clothing during the Poland winters, where he was forced at gunpoint to perform atrocities on his friends because he, uh, 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 he was a physician, and where he watched thousands of people die. And when I do a trauma training, I ask, uh, so what do you think Victor's quality of life was while he was in, in um, Auschwitz? And folks that have never read Man's Search for Meaning, they say, awful. For those that have read it, kind of, it starts to be ambivalent, and they're kind of going, "I don't really know." Um, and I say, my answer to that is, I say the answer to that question of what was Victor's quality of life on Auschwitz is why I believe the single most important book you can read in preparation for sitting across from a trauma survivor is *Man's Search for Meaning*, because when you read that book, first of all, it is uh, the the first half of that book is a trauma narrative, basically. Whoops. It is Victor uh, kind of narrating, um, turning into language the implicit sensory memories of his experience in Nazi death camp. Which for, the, for those of you who know what trauma is that heals trauma. And and reading man when I read Man's Search for Meaning today, I can feel Victor writing at his healing. I can feel him writing and getting that in language so he can put it behind him and that it's not intruding anymore. And it's a pretty cool way to read it. Um, but you get through a few pages into that book and you start seeing that there's a second meta narrative to Man's Search for Meaning. There is the narrative, which is the hard squalor of a Nazi death camp, death camp written in really rich, evocative, and beautiful language. It reads like a novel. It's a one-sitting read, um, the first half of the book. Um, but you get, I don't know, five, eight, ten pages into that book, and you start seeing that the narrative. But there's the emergence of a second story, a meta narrative. There's another story that Victor's telling, more implicitly rather than explicitly, but he talks about how he's able to find joy, peace, purpose, meaning, and love. <laughs> moves me. Moves me. Consistently. Consistently restores himself back to those states. He said, when we can no longer control the world, we're left with controlling ourselves, managing ourselves. Changing. We can no longer change the world, is what it, the quote then we are left with changing ourselves. <clears throat> and that's what Victor did. He asserted energy and focus where he had power. And that was within himself. Joy, peace, purpose, meaning, and love in a Nazi death camp. And that never ceases to move me every time I share this. And it... You know, it's it's hundreds of times a year, each year in front of audiences, that I, I tear up and I am moved by that. It's profound. And it has become for me the sine qua non, the essence of what resilience is. And... It has, it's made a huge impact on my career. It has made me much more courageous, much more resilient, and it's taught me that er, that a good life is available to every single person I ever work with, no matter what their affliction is, no matter how bad they had it, no matter how many limbs they've lost in combat, no matter what disease they have, no matter what. As I sit across from them as, as a change agent, as I am help help them to take their attention and energy away from that which is out of their control and help them to focus their attention and energy on where they have power. We can find anybody alive, joy, peace, purpose, meaning, and love, no matter how bad their situation is. And if you've got regular experiences with joy, peace, purpose, meaning, and love, you have some degree of quality of life. 
Thank you, Victor, for that gift. Because my hope no longer blows out and extinguishes when I work from those people that life has hurt the most. It enkindles more brightly because they have already survived incredible odds to be here. But I read Man's Search for Meaning the first time when I was 15 years old. I have an A score of nine. It was the first experience in my life of it was the first felt sense of hope that I ever had. It's profound. I reread Man's Search for Meaning several times, but I had reread it while we were working on all that stuff. Uh, right when we were starting working on the uh, Accelerated Recovery Program. And, and, you know, as I was reading that, I was going, wow, Victor did that in a Nazi death camp. Hmm. Shouldn't we be able to do that while we're getting paid for it? And Victor threw down the gauntlet for me. Like, there it was. Is, that, is there some way to find walking through this environment, which, which admittedly is toxic. I'm, I'm not at all arguing that your environment's not, for a lot of you, in, in healthcare environments you work in, the, for a lot of people, those are horrible places. But geez, oh man, that the evolution and maturation is to not go in there and, and, become, and become progressively victims of that environment. We need to find a way to become, be able to become immune to the toxicity of the environment. As Victor was able to do, he was hurt and he was, was wounded. But he continued to find his best self in that situation, continued to stay resilient. And then worked, you know, when he was released in 1945, worked with trauma survivors for the rest of his life until he died in 1997. I don't know, man, that's a freaking portrait of, of resilience and professional development and maturation in my book. So that's really what this was kind of, set up on top of was Victor and his ability to navigate three and a half years in a concentration camp and come out of that a stronger man with incredible loss, incredible trauma, but not, not a victim, not a victim. ultimately triumphant. And man, that's my hope for every one of y'all watching this. Is that you, I promise you, that you engage the materials of this work and you learn how to navigate through the toxic environment without being a victim and how to be healthy inside of that environment, how to carve out good quality of life in, in the environment that is toxic. You have my word on that. And Thousands of people have articulated and with empirical evidence, both qualitative and quantitative, have demonstrated that that's what comes from this workshop. So Victor offers us, as I said, he worked, once he was released, he worked for the rest of his life uh, working with trauma survivors. A lot of Holocaust survivors is who he special realized with. <coughs> and... So when he talks about what resilience is, we ought to listen. And he talks very eloquently with this, with this statement, this quote, that which is to give light must endure burning. And, you know, and years of thinking about this, that quotes both a warning and a prescription. It's a warning of what our environment is, and it is a prescription of how to be healthy in that environment. I'm going to deal with the prescription at the end of this training, but I want to deal with the warning right now. It's always interesting when, I, when we've done this in a training full of docs, I, I ask this question when we get to the slide. I say, how many of you in this room have chosen to be givers of light? And you look at docs and they all sit there like this. Profound for me that they've spent half a million dollars 
eight years of their lives in training and how many years in practice. And that their environment is so toxic that they're too ashamed to admit in the context of their peers that the reason why they're in medicine is to be a healer, to be a giver of life. That's kind of profound and sad for me. So I shame them a little bit and tell them that. I think that there are a lot of docs that are in it for the money. And God bless them. That's it's it's a way to it's a uh pro social way to be able to make money. Um but I don't think a lot I don't think the majority of docs are in in medicine to make money. I think most of them have an ethos and a mission of of care and healing and and um at least at one time we're we're connected to the Hippocratic oath. <clears throat> so for those of us who have chosen to be givers of light in the lives of other people who are suffering what's Victor telling us is going to happen to us not that we could burn or that we might burn He's telling us that we're going to burn and that there is no navigation around it. That's useful information for me because what I was taught in my training programs, uh, implicitly, like no professor ever came out and said this, but the implicit message that I got in my training programs was that if you're stoic enough, if you're strong enough, if you are... Uh, objective enough oh my glasses are there you know but if I'm kind of have my my portfolio and I'm listening to my clients and I'm doing you know that kind of psychodynamic approach of of tabula rasa and flat and staying walled off from my clients that there's somehow I will be able to to not be affected by those folks pain And what Victor is saying is that's a lie. And that was refreshing for me to, to get that. Because as long as I believe that these other people, these professors that I had, had it right, that, that there is this kind of secret path through this work where you're not affected by it. And I ain't on it. But I look, I start comparing my insides with your outsides. It looked like that you guys are all on it. But I've somehow missed it. There's something so flawed and damaged with me that I'm not, I, I didn't get that memo. I don't know how to do this without it really disrupting and hurting me. And, but it looks like that all of you do. And can you see the impact that that has upon a, on a caregiver? Is it like more isolation, more walled off? Is that, man, something's wrong with me that, that I am, I'm I'm so flawed that I can't that I'm can't function. Everybody else is, but not me. And that makes my peers dangerous. When you start seeing that there's just no way to do this, there is no way to hear a rape narrative. There is no way to witness the parents loss of a child and be a part of that without it profoundly affecting your spirit there's just not a way to do it and still have connection and empathy you can shut down the empathy window and not get compassion fatigue but now you're withholding the thing that is the medicine which helps your clients heal which is the therapeutic relationship in in, in my world and 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 even you know the more we're learning in in the hardcore medical world that that relational process is a mitigator of positive outcomes, significant mitigator of positive outcomes. And I'm withholding it. If the only, pa only path I've got is to shut down my empathy, now I'm withholding that. Man, once you get it, then it's going to hurt, and there's nothing I can do about it. Now we can relax. And don't want to take 
too much more time on this, but I do want to make sure you understand that there is a huge difference between pain and suffering. And what pain is, is an electrochemical signal from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. You stub your toe, you cut your hand, there is an electrochemical signal at the, at the uh, side of the wound, and it travels up the brachial nerve, and it registers in your brain. That's all pain is. It's a signal. And what suffering is, is the meaning that we make about that signal. And what I'm absolutely certain of, having studied autonomic nervous system for the past 20 years, is that there is painful learning with pain. <laughs> and so what happens is that when we have a pain signal, when we experience pain, we also have involuntarily, subcortically, not reaching for a lot of us frontal lobe awareness, all beneath that autonomically, we have a threat response associated with the pain signal. So you got the threat response jacking you up. And if you're in chronic pain, which is, uh, you, you ready for this? Uh, healthcare is chronic pain. Um, so if you got, if you're in a healthcare environment where you're experiencing pain a lot of the day from, you know, the witnessing and engaging with people who are suffering, because that's your job then what's also happening is you're having a threat response all day long. And that is unsustainable. It will kill you. Your threat response will kill you. And ACE data shows us that. You know, people with ACE scores of six versus people that ACE scores is zero. And ACE score six, somebody has ACE score six, is living in a threat response most of their waking consciousness. What, what impacts that have on a person? 20 years, loss of life. It kills you. So a whole lot about being able to endure burning is about being able to interrupt the threat response as we're navigating through our, through our day. How to be able to, to relax into the painful experiences that we encounter as we're working. To be able to relax into the environment as being screwed up, as being inadequate to do the work that we're doing. But there, we're, we're here today charged with our job to do the best we can. Yeah, we can continue to work towards the evolution of this environment, but to stay in a threat response while I'm walking through an environment that is inadequately equipped for me to be able to do my work, and I'm still going to do it, then it's just dumb to continue to have a threat response in that situation. It's not helping. So as you learn to interrupt the threat response, you are able to be in toxic environments and not get sick by them. You are able to have pain and not suffer from it. I think that's what Victor was trying to get at, is that we have to evolve and mature professionally, that we can put ourselves in toxic environments and not be victims of those toxic environments, not be victims of work that if we do it unconsciously and involuntarily and... and um, autonomically, then we're going to become symptomatic. That what professional maturation is, is the evolution to become intentional about the way that we manage ourselves in our environments. And for those of you who have suffered enough and that you were ready to embark upon a pathway of maturation, that's what the second half of this course is, is how to, what five factors evolve you into a mature enough professional that your workplace doesn't doesn't damage you and you're going to be in pain a lot but as you evolve you learn how to experience pain without suffering from it bada bing bada boom